It's me, Herbert Hoover. Does anyone know who Herbert Hoover was? Who is Herbert Hoover? It's me, Herbert Hoover. With the pop, uh, with the fashionable fedora hat of the 1920s is when it first became popular. Does anyone remember who is Herbert Hoover? Yes, Jocelyn. Uh, it was named after him. That's right. Um, uh, so there, there's a start, and you might think of the Hoover vacuum cleaner that also came in in the 1920s, although that was William Hoover, that was not me. I was the third president of three conservative Republicans in the 1920s, of Herbert Hoover. And though I took a beating, a big beating, during the Great Depression that followed my presidency, I would like to note that Americans were later nostalgic for me, as I hope we can see here in this following excerpt. From Television City in Hollywood. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. And you knew when you were there. That's what there was a bad woman. Mr. Beat the user and like Glenn Miller. terrible Cuban Missile Crisis of 1863, where our world almost came to an end. I, by the way, lived to 18, uh, six, uh, 1964, although I was president from 1929 to 1932, and I was a, a food relief administrator for the Belgians and the Europeans right after World War I, saved over 20 million lives. I, Herbert Hoover, was for the three Vs, and that is of all the 1920s conservative presidents, I was a true Victorian. I did not really appreciate Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, shown here in this famous picture of me and him taking the same limo when he was elected president over me in 1932. I did not appreciate the way he raised his sons. He, he lived a life of infidelity with other women. And this caused his sons, four of them, to become alcoholics. Uh, and this is what I thought was the price to pay when we abandoned Victorianism. I was for victory. I was for Victorianism. Victorianism to me is most congruent with Christianity. So why not embrace it? Of course, there was one little slip up that I had in my life, and that is I worked a lot of times in mine. I was a mining engineer, and I did sometimes swear like a miner. But otherwise, I was pretty true to the true... Victorian idea of a more austere, straight-laced, moral culture that I, Herbert Hoover, represented, and not those other presidents like Calvin Coolidge and Warren Gemmell Hardy. I was for V, victory. I was for voluntarism. Uh, in your textbook, in chapter 24, they call it associationalism. It's the same idea. We bring people together and reason together. I was against that charismatic president, Teddy Roosevelt, who you met earlier. Roosevelt wanted to change everything. He wanted a kind of bubbling, brilliant leader on top that would try out all sorts of new ideas. But I was a conservative. I believed we needed to consult the wisdom of the past before steaming in the present, that we should rule not by charisma, but by consensus. I was a good Quaker. My mother pulled the mint horn was a very famous Quaker lecturer. She even left our family for a while to give talks. She died when I was 11. But in any case, um, I believe in coming together and reasoning together like we do in a Quaker meeting house. Uh, rather than trusting some charismatic liberal trying to take us into some new age, trying all sorts of experiments, this that I, Herbert Hoover, uh, opposed. So I was for victory. I was for Victorianism, I was for voluntarism, and I was also for verve, which I defined as a quality to be able to stand up and compete. When I went overseas, 
I was known as Star Spangled Banner Hoover because I was so proud of my country. My country has been honed on the grindstone of individualistic competition. And this is why we have become number one in the world economy. Indeed, as we'll see, only 40% of the world's wealth at one point in the 1920s. And this indeed was the greatest era for American wealth comparatively to the world history. And I was a president during the 1920s, and I helped make it happen. This idea of verb, standing up and being able to take on the fury of life. You know, when I got dressed in the morning, I got dressed super fast. I ate my breakfast super fast because I knew that time was money. And at one point, I had six offices throughout the world as a mining engineer. I, well, I one time said, and I know it may seem kind of offensive, that a man isn't worth much if he reaches the age of 40 and is not a millionaire. <laughs> this why I don't think Yax is very, amounts to very much. You know, he's way over 40 and he's never become a millionaire. He can't even afford me a decent fedora hat. He's got this stupid feather and it looks like a gangster. Of course, the gangsters took up on the fedoras and that helped make it really popular by the 1930s. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, I believe that America was full of possibility and someone who really cared would take advantage. He would have the verve to stand up to the plate and try to hit a home run. Now, I was orphaned at the age of 11. I felt very abandoned. At one point, I had pneumonia so bad that I thought I was dying. The person who came to my rescue was Dr. John Minthorn, my uncle, who had just lost a son himself, took me into his family in Oregon, saved me from pneumonia, and brought me up and actually allowed me to go to Stanford University, one of the first students there, a great university in California. I heartily recommend it to you, along with Harvard and Yale. It was at Stanford that I met my love, Lou Henry. She was very mysterious and elusive. Um, and indeed, she was much higher up on the glamour scale than I was. But I kept on writing her letters, and after I graduated from Stanford, getting richer and richer, I had majored in geology, but I went into mining, and I went around the world. And you know, a girl's a fool if she doesn't marry a, a rich millionaire, someone who can accommodate her, her needs. Uh, so I just wrote her in her letters uh, continually, saying what I would offer and how much I loved her. And gradually, she left her romantic fantasies a little bit. Uh, she joined me in China. Uh, she is the first first lady to learn an Asian language to know a language, a Mandarin Chinese. And she's the only first lady that I know of who killed someone with a Colt revolver. Because when we were in Beijing, uh, working on these mines, advising the Chinese government, uh, we had a situation where Chinese were trying to throw out the foreigners in the so-called Boxer Rebellion uh, of 1900. And um, uh, my wife Lu and I were holed up in Beijing, and my wife actually pulled out a Colt. And, and killed somebody. Uh, she also uh, uh, was kind of a, uh, a cowgirl herself. Uh, so we were going all around the world to various mysterious places. I can also tell you that having offices in six places of the world as a, a great uh, doctor of sick minds, that the best mine in the world was Altai, just beyond the Ural Mountains, in uh, what it became the Soviet Union. Now, I would later help save many Russians from starvation. My minds were a great boon to them. But did I any, get any thanks from that terrible socialist Bolshevik government that took over in 1918? I should say not. <coughs> well, actually, I did get a little reward from them uh, at first. But then they, they just forgot me. They never paid me any the dividends that they had promised for helping them uh, to get into the all-time mine scene. I mean, they got bronze, they got silver, they got gold. The reason why the Soviet Union beat us to the moon in Sputnik in 1957 was not so much that they had a good system. Communism was terrible. But rather, they had great resources. And I, Hoover, the mining engineer, helped them, this huge country, to develop these great uh, resources. So I was a world traveler, uh, coming from a mining engineer. I've been visited people like the Dalai Lama. But I didn't take to that odd ball. He looked like just some kind of American school child dressed up in a bathrobe. I was always a good American, and sometimes that uh, confounded people. Well, I was appointed by President Wilson, a man who I liked, even though Franklin Roosevelt, my nemesis, later said that I didn't like Woodrow Wilson. I got along fine with him. And his plan for world peace, I was a Quaker. 
I adored the idea of the League of Nations, the coming end of strife, a war to end all wars. Um, but in any case, he, Wilson also put me in charge of the relief effort to feed starving Europeans at the end of World War I, because I had had such extensive mining experience and was seen as a, such a, a logistic expert. Um, I went to work, and I had hundreds of idealistic Americans working with me. Uh, I am credited Herbert Hoover with having saved more people in Europe and Russia from starvation after World War I than Stalin would later kill. So we're talking about like 20 million people uh, that had no access to food except through American farmers and the exports that I was uh, taking into control. Now you would have thought that, Amer that America would have been held up high in esteem after the end of this great world war which we won thanks to a million dough boys entering the conflict in 1917, 1918. But what happened, of course, at the end of World War I was that we had the Bolshevik Communist Marxist Revolution of Vladimir Lenin in Russia. Russia sued for peace early with Germany in the tr dangerous Treaty of Brest-Litvask. And uh, here we have this, this revolutionary, this simpleton, who uh, announced to his people, rob the robbers! That is, take from the rich people. And let's have socialism, equality. Let's have the dictatorship of the proletariat. Oh, it was some dictatorship, all right. It was a terrible megalomaniac type system which was constantly engaging in attacks against so-called counter-revolutionaries, but actually just eliminating whole swaths of people that were thought to be against the regime. But in any case, a socialistic, Marxist, uh, equalitarian in theory idea, which was against my idea of capitalism and showing verb and individualism, honed on the grindstone of competition, was against my ideals, began to inspire a worldwide movement. And it looked like everything that I was for. You know, I was a multi-millionaire. I, I was into capitalism, saving the world with food. That everything that I had worked for, everything that America had worked for, everything that Woodrow Wilson had worked for, was all becoming undone by this terrible virus of socialism and communism. How can young people today be for Bernie Sanders? They wanted to take us back to this terrible collectivist system. The reason why I was admired in that TV show, All in the Family, which you can access uh, on YouTube, um, is that people saw how this liberalism led to the riots of the 1960s. They wanted to go back to just straight capitalism. But here we are confronted with the specter of terrorism. Indeed, the 1920s was in so many ways. And remember, I'm a 1920s rep because I got this fedora hat, which came in on the 1920s. Uh, the 1920s was in many ways the, the watershed of modern America. It was when tuberculosis gave out and heart attacks came in as a chief cause of death. One was uh, a disease of production, of people working too hard producing things. Another was a disease of consumption as we came in to have a society where things were way more abundant the mass society of the 1920s, where, where the class society of the 19th century gave way to the mass society of the 1920s, where a country that it was full of various ethnic groups in the 19th century was more homogenized. By what great inventions bringing people together in the 1920s? Does anyone remember? What helped create Homo Americanus, a, a kind of togetherness, a feeling of one society. There were some new inventions. What was that? Uh, not exactly yet, but you're on the right track. Radio. Radio, radio was, was, was very big, and so this was the time too of motion pictures. So, so radio and motion pictures gave everyone a chance to participate in a common culture. But even as then there was this pervasive sense of a national mass American society, this is the time when we first start seeing school shootings. This is a time when we first start seeing this kind of nihilistic attack on our civilization as we know it. Today, you know, later on we'd have Osama bin Laden and various uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists. In my time, it was Luigi Galliani. He was an anarchist from Italy who actually lived out his life in Italy but was sending over bombers to take out Americans and start a revolution at the same time that Vladimir Lenin was proclaiming a world revolution from the Soviet Union uh, there in Russia. And uh, we had a lot of terrible incidents in the 
1920s. For instance, one time Cardinal Moonlight in Chicago had a dinner. The anarchists tried to poison them because they were Catholics. They were believing God. The anarchists were atheists. And um, the anarchists used too much poison, used too, too much arsenic, so just all the guests got sick. But could you imagine what a stain in our history that would have been if all those people had died uh, because of this arsenic poison? Uh, we have cases uh, right after the war of great strikes being urged on by Marxists, of a police strike in Boston that brought my nemesis, Calvin Coolidge, to the, the fore. In fact, we had a red scare in the 1920s, a fear that Vladimir Lenin's call for revolution would wash across the shores of America. Remember, we had Eugene Debs, a socialist leader in 1912, getting a million votes, being put in jail as a dissenter in World War I. This is Eugene Debs, D-E-B-S. Uh, so we had a sizable red, black, socialist, anarchist movement, and they were, they were trying things right after the war, and we were afraid that the system that we had built and worked for, and which make, was making America d number one, was coming undone. Thus we had the so-called Red Scare, when a fellow Quaker of mine, uh, A. Mitchell Palmer, who was Attorney General, unleashed a series of raids against the Reds, and we sent does anyone remember, what was Red Emma again? Remember Red Emma Goldman and her boyfriend Alexander Berkman? Do you remember how they tried to assassinate Henry Frick and the Carnegie Corporation? They tried to cause a big revolution? Well, we shipped them on an arc over to the Soviet Union because we were not going to handle those people anymore. This is a time of fright. And, you know, lately, of course, has been Wall Street attacks on Wall Street as a simple miracle. We had that too in the early 1920s. We had a bomb go out, injured 400 people uh, in Wall Street uh, during the 1920s. Well, what helped to turn the tide against this terrible affront of worldwide communism and the call for it? Well, I think it was the great rise of American productivity in the 1920s that put those Bolsheviks to shame. And cause them to put blinkers on their society rather than try to expand outward with their propaganda. America became a great country of cars, credit, and Coca-Cola. Um, when the time when we had the electric vacuum cleaner, it was a time when we had electric appliances. And there I am with my fedora head. Perhaps the greatest commodity of, of the 1920s was that of the automobile. You know, just as uh, Google and the information business is kind of big in the early 20th century, early 21st century, so we have the automobile in the 1920s. A, a town like Mount Pleasant would not have really been accommodated to the automobile in 1920, but by 1930, there are stop signs, there are stop lights, there are uh, indications down the median of a road of which cars are going right, which cars are going left. Um, so we, we've become an automobilized culture, and it's because of Henry Ford, who was a kind of quirky manufacturer from Dearborn, Michigan, who I kind of got along with. But um, does anyone know how, how did he get started? He basically uh, used the assembly line that had been developed in the Chicago meatpacking industry, and uh, found a way to mass produce cars. Uh, Henry. Ford was very thin-minded. He hooked up his first motor to his wife's kitchen sink around 1900. But he was also a man who was from an Irish background, who was trying to forget his past and willing to blend into this new, great American society. He felt that we should have cars for everyone, rather than just luxury people. The luxury cars were not American. So he perfected the Model T Ford, which uh, could float in which went down in price during the 1920s from $850 to $240. Can you imagine that? Just because he did use this assembly line um, tactic. And what was great about Henry Ford as well is that we had a lot of workers who before could not have afforded this car, and Henry Clay raised their wages and lowered their hours. The Avell led initially, of course, by Sam Gompers, as you might remember, had been asking and clamoring, you know, we want the 40-hour work week. 
We want the $5 a day. 40 hours a week, $5 a day. V for victory. Henry Ford gave them both. This was a captain of industry, providing labor what they wanted so that they would have more free time and more money so that they could buy Model T cars and we could have a whole country swarming with this conveyance which was so good for women who were sometimes at the mercy of males when they were trying to take horses riding side saddle and for African Americans and other minorities to be able to have some mobility. By 1929, the average American family has a Model T. Is this not wonderful? Of course, uh, some people have been crit critical of this uh, 1920s uh, Fordism, as it was called in Germany. Um, one thing that Ford does is he has an assembly line, of course, where he doesn't allow people to talk. And uh, one of the reasons why he went down eight hours a day is because he was losing so many people. He didn't want to have to do the same thing on this assembly line, like you know, eight hours. So what's happening here is actually the workforce is getting a little dumbed down. And the Nazis would adopt, would adopt this idea. They'd call it Ford Ismos because they wanted the Poles to do all the assembly line work or the Slavs, uh, while they, the superior race, would then have to uh, go through this kind of uh, very ordinary work. But, but as Hoover notes, uh, this was, of course, very important in terms of raising working class income and creating a kind of you know, mass society. Uh, any questions about that? Uh, of course, uh, it wasn't a, a machine with a lot of gadgets, like our iPhones or something like that. Uh, they didn't, for instance, have speedometers in the model T. They were all painted black, as Ford was trying to always bring the price down. Um, Chevrolet would kind of outflank him, GM, because they would try colored automobiles. Uh, uh, he was, had this kind of cost consciousness of the 19th century Rockefeller Morgan Carnegie types. But in any case, uh, you knew what speed you were doing by what rattled. So for instance, if you were going 20 miles an hour, your dashboard rattled. If you're going 30 miles an hour, your, your uh, steering wheel rattled. And if your teeth were rattling, you were obviously going 40 miles an hour. Any comments or questions about uh, uh, And of course, we remember also the great radio of the 1920s, uh, where we could now teach people f the French language over the radio, and we could broadcast ball games that would bring people together. Of course, we had big uh, wooden boxes that people would listen to. Uh, this was the age of American capitalism and high drive, of American productivity. You can remember that 40%, 40% of the world's wealth lying between underneath American bank vaults, American pockets, American backyards. We were playing the game well. Well, even as Bolshevism kind of shriveled up into its Asiatic cocoon in the mid-1920s, so, however, another problem began to assault my sense of value and decorum, my Victorianism, that is, and that was the rise of untrammeled sexuality and decadence. This was the age of the flappers. Does anyone remember why did they call girls flappers in the 1920s? Their dresses would kind of flap around. They, they had uh, galoshes that would kind of flap around. It was a kind of a free and easy style of kind of butterfly personality. They would say kind of odd, strange things. Remember in Victorian times, these kind of girls would have been called the flipperty chippet. Uh, but now there's a sort of um, excitement about flirtation. One strange thing about the flappers was that they looked like a tube of toothpaste. I mean, when I went after Lou, she was a very buxom woman. Why were these women of the 1920s de-emphasizing their curves, if I may be so explicit, and trying to actually take their breasts down? Um, they would have a gash of lipstick. Uh, it may be that they were trying to look very like younger girls that wouldn't get pregnant, that wouldn't remind returning doughboys of having a family. They would look like girls that were out there for a good time. And I soon realized that the movies were a mixed blessing because they brought in a lot of star flappers such as Gloria Swanson and Clara DeBow, 
who uh, began to popularize this insouciance, this free and easy attitude of a kind of a new woman, a flapper. Uh, there were movies that really transgressed moral boundaries. Uh, one movies, some of them were titled The Perfect Flapper, Our Modern Ma Maidens, Our Dancing Girls, Our Dancing Daughters. Uh, one movie advertised the uh, Neckers, Petters, Red Kisses, White Kisses, The Truth Bold, Sensational. Another one offered pleasure mad daughters, sensation craving mothers, uh, champagne bass, petting parties in the purple dawn, all ending in one terrific smashing climax that would make you gasp. You can bet that me and Lou and I that would never attend uh, such uh, a festival of corruption as began to be seen <coughs> on our screens uh, in the 1920s uh, with these uh, flappers. This was the edge of course uh, commemorated by the great writer of the great Gatsby novel, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And perhaps we can kind of see, I kind of glitzed up, or maybe we can't see, I thought I maybe had it. <laughs> um, maybe we can see a glitzed up part, maybe you can. I, I think I might have erred here a little bit. Uh, uh, let's see. You see the rest of New York, so you came. Uninvited. This is, of course, just fiction, but it was a story of a bootlegger, the great Gatsby, who had kind of come out of a Midwestern work background to become a fabulous new American when he was getting his money by bootlegging. It's a fictional, but it kind of evokes the spirit of the so called Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age. The story is about this Gatsby throwing a party every week just to attract one girl who was already married. That's a scandal. Daisy, we can't. So, so the, the, the beer and the, the whiskey is flowing, you know, despite that uh, prohibition. And, and of course, uh, you know, what I noticed uh, uh, is that it was at that this very time of prohibition that the youth culture that was, you know, falling around the flappers and the film culture and the bootleggers uh, began to adopt a drunkenness as a kind of badge of growing up. And one sociologist found in 1927 that there were some 105 different words in college campuses to describe various stages of inebriation. Um, so if you were moderately drunk, uh, you would be called zozzled. 
Um, if a girl was drunk, they called it stinko. If you were really, really drunk, you would be burning with a low blue flame or getting the whoops and jingles. Now you can see this is getting to be a pretty combustible mixture because you have this flouting of prohibition law, you have the flappers, you have something called dating and rating. This was the time to date. Dating came in by a storm in the 20s. This is something that replaced the Victorian courtship parlor where you would be asked to go on dates. And we say dating and rating for the 1920s because it also depended on how many dates you went out on to how you rate it. And at the University of Michigan at this time, there were the sororities that would rank all the guys on campus. Uh, and if uh, they were uh, really good, they'd be okay. Uh, but it, went, it got very severe in the criticism right down to geek. And uh, Red Book Magazine was advising young ladies, uh, you know, don't be too harsh with Johnny because he might come in good for that one night when you just need to be seen with a date. Uh, because people were going on a social world. This was not a notable time for attainments and uh, among students in college education, as we'll be doing a little bit later, looking at the saga of Joe College, um, uh, kind of typical college uh, student of this time. It was, of course, a time of baseball, a time of evangelists like Amy Semple McPherson, who uh, tried to get people to a more fundamentalist understanding. <coughs> Uh, fundamentalism was in many ways another new sign of modern America. Um, unlike the old denominations and their, their kind of struggles that they had, like I was a Quaker, Presbyterians, we have these new broad swaths of religion, like evangelicalism and non-denominational churches and fundamentals. Fundamentalists were pretty much fighting against the Darwinian philosophy, um, which they saw emanating up in the flapper and in all these jazz age films uh, that we were descended from apes and therefore could hang out like apes, in my view. Um, so I was sympathetic to Amy Semple McPherson, a dynamic redhead. It was a very untraditional. You know, people say that fundamentalism was old. It was not old. It's new. We still have fundamentalism. We still have. Most Americans in opinion polls do not believe in Darwinism. Of course, it depends how you ask them the poll. <laughs> but in any case, uh, this was opposition to this idea that we're, we're descended from animals. And uh, Amy Semple McPherson was untraditional. She was a redhead that came to Los Angeles. She had been divorced. She had a child. She had a, a tambourine and a $10 bill. But she was said to have healed someone in a San Diego tent revival meeting. And she went to Los Angeles and she, she started this four square gospel tabernacle that had thousands of people coming each week to hear this dynamic redhead give her sermons that were acted out by a drama troupe at her Foursquare Gospel Tabernacle Church. This was the rise of the megachurch, just another sign that you know, if we go 100 years ago, it, the new was really emerging in this consumption society, this mad world that we see with the youth culture. One guy I admired at the fray was Charles Lindbergh, 